What's up everyone, thanks for joining. If you're watching through video in this new space, my name is Anthony, host of Dream Big Daily and creator of Dream Big & Co. And on this episode, we talk to Arafili. She's someone who created her own social media strategy for her country, Greece, is listed on Forbes 30 Under 30, and has her own social media marketing business, helping businesses and brands market to Gen Z called The Z-Link. She's 21, an entrepreneur, a dreamer, and a doer. So let's dive in to this conversation as her and I talk in depth. I have a dream. That's one small step for man. I am the greatest. You want something, go get it. Period. Arafili, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you being here. There are so many things I have to ask you, uh, and your story is definitely unique. So, nonetheless, I'm Thank excited to dive in. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> for sure. Yeah, me too. <clears throat> so, you grew up in Greece. I would love for you to talk about your origin story a little bit and just lay the ground there, and then we can start to hit hit the track and and run a little bit further down your story and of things course. you're specialized in of course yeah so i grew up in athens greece until i was 17. um so i always lived here and when i went to school i did um an education program that was basically an all french school so all of my education was in french but in greece so i kind of grew up with um very mixed influences um so grew up kind of being very exposed to other languages very quickly in other cultures and um growing up in greece was fun but i always knew that i wanted to leave at least for university and then probably explore my options so um i applied to universities in the uk and at 17 i just moved to scotland and um, now i'm in my fourth year oh, wow. studying in glasgow that's incredible what was it like going off on your own? Because that was something you wanted to do, be independent, but then being able uh, to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it was um, easier than I thought, to be honest. And it mm -hmm. helps that I think Scotland is a very welcoming place. And uh, it has a lot of, uh, like the people in Scotland are very similar to Greek people in the way that they really embrace uh, hospitality and they're very kind and open and kind of like loud. So it was easy to transition because I didn't feel like I was in a very foreign place, you know, besides being mm -hmm. in the North and having a completely different climate. But uh, yeah, I, I think I integrated faster than I expected. So that was very good. Yeah. Like I was saying, uh, pre uh, recording this, this is one mm -hmm. of the longer and distance interviews we've done. I just find it ins insane that, that you're literally in Greece right now and we're able to do this. <laughs> it's so cool. Yeah, I know, right? It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but in terms of the social media marketing stuff, because uh, for those who don't know, they'll get to know as they listen now, you're into social media marketing, um, highly adept in that, and you were sort of inclined to do it since teenage years. You said you were into it since 13. Like, what mm -hmm. was the what was the interest that led you into doing that? Cause you've been doing it for like, it'll be in two years, be like a decade for doing it. Yeah. Well, that sounds crazy. Um, so basically the, um, the background is that I started kind of exploring the digital world quite early. My dad was very tech driven as well. So I had a laptop mm -hmm. in primary school and kind of would play around and, you know, see the, the internet world. Um, and quite early on, I discovered I really liked learning how to create websites and blogs and stuff and just do very basic stuff like that. But, um, I would spend a lot of time just exploring the possibilities. And so of course, then when Instagram started emerging in like 2012, I hopped in that and explored that as well. And by the age of like 12 or 13, I already, I had ended up basically managing an Instagram page to like 20,000 followers and Twitter as well. And then I somehow had become the admin of like some of these popular Greek Facebook pages. That <laughs> I, I didn't go into it consciously at all. It was just something that I enjoyed doing. 
um so like very much managing social media channels but i you know for fun of course and the biggest thing was instagram for me back then because i it grew very fast i had an account where i would post like memes and stuff and just see what worked and what didn't and mm. i I have, I have a question i have a question on that yeah. topic that i'll mm -hmm. ask in the future with experimenting but yeah please keep going mm -hmm. perfect yeah feel free but uh yeah so that uh i was very much doing that quite a lot and just trying to figure out what worked and what didn't and i was i started working with a few local companies to sponsor them on instagram and stuff like that and um that continued until i was like finishing high school and when I was applying for university, I really hadn't thought at all about marketing ever or social media marketing, you know, didn't really know that was a thing that is like what you would call it. Mm -hmm. um, had never thought about it at all. And I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I applied for art history for university because I really like art and I'm very um, theoretical as a person. So I thought that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. And in Scotland, the degree structures are quite flexible. So they let you pick a lot of electives, kind of like in the US, which doesn't happen a lot of in Europe. Uh, and then you can make one of these electives your major more easily. So when choosing that, I saw that they had a degree called digital media and information. And I was mm. like, I like digital media. You know, I've been doing that for quite a bit. That could be good. <laughs> And then I guess I started thinking more of um, the fact that I had some experience in the digital sphere that was like a bit above average for that age because I had spent so much time doing that. And I wasn't very conscious about turning that into a career, but I like my first internship right out of high school was in a business incubator in Greece where they were like well what can you do well like how could you help us and i was like i could do social media mm. and so i did that there for a while and that is really the first time that it came to my mind that maybe i could use the social media skills in a professional environment and see where that takes me mm. and then it just progressed from there <laughs> yeah i see so so you really quadrupled down on your strengths it, it uh, yeah i guess the... so <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> And I, I was going to ask you, you humbly said you, you manage some bigger accounts, but I know mm -hmm. as well, you've helped uh, actual country of Greece that I, I want to, uh, you come up with a strategy for them, which I'm interested to hear okay. about in a second. And then also <laughs> you helped, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but uh, Uffizi, the, the largest museum Uffizi, in Italy. Yeah. yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what you did with the European parliament exactly, but can you talk about like what makes first off what you learn from them but then what makes successful like content engines like really efficient and successful content engines because those are really those are some big places you know you really have to know <laughs> your stuff to do it well um well these were all internships very different ones mm. the european parliament they have a an office in, in athens as they do in most european capitals so I did um, just digital marketing in that office and mainly I worked on their website and also just did Instagram management. Um, and when I was there, I just, it was very interesting because it was the first time that I, what I had to do was to use social media to recruit Gen Z audiences for the European elections that were happening back then. Mm. And um, it was the first time that I kind of had to do this sort of active outreach for a company or an organization. So that was a very interesting experience because it was quite different. It was uh, a lot more niche than anything I had explored so far. And um, the Uffizi Museum was also an internship that is pretty self-explanatory. Like it's a very big museum, so they have a very strong social media presence. And the um, I worked in their digital strategies department. That was great because it was in Florence. And <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I I really missed that. It was a great experience. Uh, but um, mainly, what I did there was I spent my time benchmarking all the big museums in the world to see how they use their social media mm -hmm. to then implement some new strategy points into the Fitzy strategy. 
So that taught me how to do like effective competitor analysis when it came to social media strategy without having access to any like monitoring tools. Um, and it was very interesting. I loved doing that because it was very research based and I just had to, I did like a 200 slide presentation on every wow. big museum based on like country or continent, I don't remember. Um, to, to kind of compare how they use, say, Instagram stories and how they use Twitter and if they tweeted in English or in their native language and how mm. that worked for them, how much engagement they got. So it basically was the first time that I had to look at social media analytics so closely without using any tool and kind of um, try to interpret what that means. Mm. And then in Greece, <laughs> I um, am, I don't think I can say too much about that yet just because it's an upcoming project and I <laughs> don't know how much of it is public at this stage. But um, I did an internship with the Greek, like a team of the Greek government that is working on creating sort of a rebrand for the country. Although they don't want to call it a rebrand because it sounds too much like marketing speech. So it's more like a, a new narrative for the country. Mm. But I created a social media strategy there. And of course, that teaches you a lot because it is nation branding. Um, and that is not something that I ever had the opportunity to, to do before, to even like think existed. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that was really cool because you're doing a social media strategy, but it's for a country. It's not for a company or an entrepreneur. And uh, it's very different. The sort of campaigns that you come up with are very different. And then, of course, your target audience is <laughs> um, much wider than what it usually is in such jobs. Um, mm. So... And that was also the first time that I created like a really large scale social media strategy. Um, so yeah, these were three very insightful internships and all of them, I think that's why I liked doing a lot of internships at that point because every one of them was so different and taught me really different things. Yeah, that, that's an immense, so, yeah. Am yeah, that's an immense amount of experience. I mean, that, that's <laughs> incredible. You. Yeah. It was in the summers in between the university. I see. I see. Yeah. That's, uh, as someone who lives in Greece, I'm sure you have a really good understanding of what people want to see. But you think of like when I was in Philadelphia, they have like Travel Philly or uh, Travel Brazil, like all these different Instagram accounts to go to yeah. those locations, right? And uh, mm -hmm. to be able to influence like a whole tourism, like relocation of citizens is insane to me. Um, yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, You're right. I, and there's, I think every country has these sort of accounts that are like visit, you know, visit Italy. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. And I, I was going to ask you too, because I find the entry into people's marketing background so cool like for you it's usually like psychology based or has that underlying theme to it and for you you study like mm -hmm. arts history so yeah like in what way what way did you were you able to see certain things you learn with that and be like oh okay these are these are just the same cycles but in modern times uh with what's mm -hmm. going on nowadays with social and digital that's a great question. Um, I actually hadn't thought about this until very recently because I was, I'm doing some master's applications right now. And of course, they're for marketing since I've never studied it academically, but I had to relate it to my current degree, which is art history with digital media and information studies. So I'm doing that as a double major. Uh, but the art history part has helped me a lot in developing basically the critical thinking skills that are so useful in marketing, as well as um, it really teaches you how to sort of deconstruct content and understand why visual imagery becomes popular, why it doesn't. And mm. I think it, it sounds quite vague, but it familiarizes you with this visual language that we all subconsciously use um, very profoundly. And then that gives you some skills that are quite transferable to marketing because of course, you know, it's so visuals, especially now in marketing are so important. And with what I do right now with my agency, aesthetic is 
at the at the center you know of what we deal with with our clients so it's really important i think to be able to understand visual trends um as as well as possible so art mm. history really helped me with that yeah absolutely yeah and uh which we'll touch on but uh Arafili launched uh, the mm-hmm. Z-Link in, what was it, in May of this year? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's incredible. So, like, putting your Thank putting you. your skills and use to helping others and being able to monetize off of it. Um, talking about that, too, I had, this is going to be a long-winded thing, but it'll make sense because it's going to be a quote, okay, one, no quote, one quote by you and then the actual question. So, when I think about um, content, I think about context. And you, like, you know your stuff. You absolutely do. And in, in, in the way I've listened to podcasts you've had before with people or what you know, with the fact that you have an agency, you know your stuff and you talk about context, right? And I think of mm-hmm. the attention spans are getting shorter in the next generation, but people still like to binge Joe Rogan episodes or Jordan mm-hmm. Peterson lectures. So yeah. I feel as though, is it, is it shorter attention spans or just creating really 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 good content and then this is this is the one quote that uh that you mentioned but it was in one of your pieces in the european heroes on how internet's changing people's lives you said the internet's like money you cannot identify it's good or evil in general Mm -hmm. as it already forms part of society and it will Mm -hmm. depend on individual conditions which is it's it's true it's facts it's like all about context and I'm, I'm glad it resurfaced for you. <laughs> but no, it's true. Like you really, yeah. it shows since, and that was written like a couple of years ago, you know your stuff. So I would, I would Thank love you. for us to like really dive into how, mm-hmm. like, you know, that crux of things. Yeah, great. Um, wow, I completely forgot about the European heroes thing. It's interesting that you mentioned that because yeah, I, I was talking about the internet in relation to politics mm-hmm. back then, but um, it was around mm-hmm. the same time that I was doing the European parliament stuff. So it's interesting. Um, about what you said regarding attention spans, I think the, I think it's both uh, understanding that it has to be, you know, quickly capturing attention and creating really good content. Because as a generation, I think we are people that, while we have a short attention span, shorter at least than any previous generation as an average um once we like something and we're sold on it then Mm -hmm. we're very loyal uh, media consumers and we're a generation that really participates in media and um we consume a lot as (laughs) as you (laughs) say as well like why would we be so why would we so easily binge watch like 10 hours of of that um so i think what I always have in mind when creating strategies or content for clients and stuff is that you have like eight seconds to capture someone's attention. And of course, time is like a currency, but so is the internet. So the, the intersections there are very complex to navigate. And um, yeah, I think that if you're very mindful about the content you're creating and it's very genuine and the right people res- it resonates with the right target audience, basically from, from um, like a few seconds after they see it, then you get to the point where this generation specifically is going to be on track to become like a loyal consumer of your content. Mm. So I think it's about making like a really good first impression <laughs> and there is quite some pressure going into it because, yeah. uh, you know, you don't have a lot of time to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's well said. And, and what I thought of too, is like the, the generation kind of cuts out the, uh, the, the nuance like they cut out the bullshit you know they just want yeah <laughs> they just they, they know like they know they know what they want they know what's good um because then from there on it's kind of like it seems it seems uh ungenuine but it's actually just like being honest with themselves and with others which is interesting mm-hmm. yeah definitely definitely yeah. but we need transparency you know <laughs> yeah exactly they, exactly that and, and going yeah. back to the that 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 being so important uh i wanted to resurface the question of experimenting so how do you or how have you seen like creating this really good contextual content but then being able to experiment like a b test some things or just uh try new stuff without 
losing some of that touch and feel of actual brand. You know? It's tricky. It's a tr- it's always tricky to navigate, and I don't have I don't think I have like a very good answer to that because if there's you know a, um, like a technique that applies to everything, I haven't discovered it yet. But uh, what works for me is just trying to identify patterns between different projects I've worked on and mm-hmm. content I've created for, even if they are like completely different industries. And then just trying to really understand what works and why it works to see how I can integrate the things that seem to um, bring better engagement and everything into everything I do and all the content I advise clients to create, for example. Mm. So, you know, experimentation is always going to be a key part of, of marketing at least and social media marketing specifically. Um, and I don't think that you you necessarily lose the like the brand in the process because um, like experimentation is fine. No one expects you to get everything right on the first try. <laughs> True. As long yeah. as you can identify patterns and kind of see how you can apply that across different things, um, that's how you just lose the need for further experimentation as you go along. I think. Yeah. To to experiment, it shows that. Uh some of the brands are courageous, but sometimes you have like memes that never hit right. And, and, and <laughs> yeah. in the comments, they just like, they, they bash people, but then you have people like, uh, you know, Chipotle or Wendy's, like they're amazing mm-hmm. on Twitter. It's just, yeah, just... they are. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and for, for the Z link, right. You're bringing on some mm-hmm. clients. Like what is the, uh, normal process you would go through? Cause maybe someone listening has an uncle, who has a company and then they come to the Z link eventually from hearing this and they need your mm-hmm. help. But like, what, what do you, cause I know it always starts with strategy, but what do you usually look for uh, when you onboard some, some clients? Uh, what I look for when I have those like first meetings with potential clients is I, I've realized since I started freelancing a couple of years ago that I mm-hmm. really, it's very important to me to work with clients that know what they want. I know it sounds very cliche, but it's very important. You know, I used to not be conscious of that at all. Um, But now I really try to see if a client knows their business and understands the shortcomings of their business and um, knows what they want. But, you know, having clients that understand the challenges of their industry and of their business model and everything without you having to tell them is really important. Um, and I have had experiences where like before the Z link, when I was just freelancing, where I have worked with clients that were just like, um, not aware of the, like the landscape they were working in. Like Mm. you sort of didn't want to break it to them, you know, that kind of thing. And there is no time for this right now. (laughs) So yeah. And I, I had that in mind a few months ago and then I was looking at some stuff by Y Combinator and um i was just like encouraging a friend of mine to apply for his startup and i saw that one of the most important things they say they look for in the application process or the interviews they do is seeing founders that will openly tell you the shortcomings of their business model and everything and will tell you what they can overcome what they can't overcome how they're gonna do it so Mm. being very aware of that or else they assume that you haven't thought about it you know and yeah. that's obviously really negative. So I'm also quite aware of that when I'm working with new people, just because I think it's really important to proceed. That I love that because it, it's sort it's sort of like the uh, conscious competence. They, yeah. they say like <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, like you like you know you know where not to go, um, which allows you to mm-hmm. focus more. Because then Y Combinator says it a ton. Um, you know, some of the best founders ever in the world in history say focus. So you can't focus if you don't know where not to go to then where to go to. Yeah, exactly. That's cool. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, so would you say, is that like the, the fault? Cause I was going to ask, uh, one of the things in my queue was like, what are some of the failures or like the, the common themes people like the pitfalls clients have, or people have when trying to get attention? Is it like mm-hmm. not, is it like them trying to do everything and not knowing what to do? Um, 
So specifically for Gen Z, you mean, or in general? A Gen Z would be nice. Yeah, focusing mm -hmm. on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. The things I notice um, the most often are, for example, that a lot of brands want to reach young people, but go into it just very blindly trying to follow some trends and applying like Gen Z marketing advice they read on like social media today without being genuine about it. And that is something that, as you mentioned at the beginning as well, our generation increasingly can now perceive and identify when they see it. So if a brand is not being genuine and authentic, you'll realize eventually. And it's just that I think a lot of brands don't realize that at the beginning or they might not realize they're doing it. And it's just a very important thing to be self-aware as a brand or as a marketer about how you're coming across and about why you're creating the content that you're creating. So, and I mean, I think as, as you probably know as well, um, and I'm sure you've seen too companies, especially in the last few months or the last couple of years, trying to like participate in social justice trends. It's, it's really hard to put, you know, um yeah to to phrase it but basically just um uh, engaging in performative activism across social media to gain the favorability of younger generations but without implementing those principles that they vouch for in the way that they do business so mm -hmm. like you, they'll post a black lives matter post once and do nothing else about it ever again and then you see their c-suite is just made of like 10 middle-aged white guys um, so that's not very helpful. Yeah. And I think our generation can see through that. And then it's just, uh, it really doesn't help your brand, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. No, that, that's, that was well articulated. I completely agree. And, <laughs> Thank and, you. and then to that, it's like, because uh, I want to say one thing and then I'll get to my next question. It's like, you're kind of like a psychologist mm -hmm. and like a, a, a therapist for people. Because when you, the, the brands and, and companies are kind of like, individuals right i mean they're becoming mm -hmm. so and individuals are actually becoming companies too but um you kind of have to have them see their blind spots and uh yeah you can do that if their ego is really fragile and stuff but uh you're how, right how, yeah actually yeah and like for say for like tiktok you have trends mm -hmm. always hitting the millions and billions like how does one how does one if say they're successfully you know posting or organically their their reach is going crazy how do they hop on some trends without being too uh like like trying to trying too hard you know what i mean yeah <laughs> cuz i see i see trends um, as like a an accelerator mm -hmm. you're right they are an accelerator uh that's a really great question and that's uh that was always on my mind when i started doing this because part of the thing that was driving me to do it was that I had seen brands so many times fall into that trap and I was like, no, just no, <laughs> you know, that's not it. Um, <laughs> like it can be better than that. So mm. again, I'm not sure if there is one answer I can give to this because it's very case specific. Um, mm. So yeah, let me, let me, to, let me mm, ask then, uh, after you answer this, I would love for you to give an example of your favorite brand and we can kind of dissect that, you know what I mean? To just get great. real specific, but you could keep going. Mm -hmm, great. Um, so what was I saying? Yeah, so yes, the that, trends. Uh, yeah. Sorry about that. So for a brand, it's okay, it's okay. To, I think, uh, more successfully leverage trends without seeming like they're trying too hard. It's uh, really important to do it in a way that comes from the brand itself and not from like external pressures, if that makes sense. Like the more genuine you can keep it, the better. And I'm sure that you've seen, as you mentioned, Wendy's and stuff, brands that do something on social media that draws attention, uh, positive attention, are usually the ones that just don't care about how it comes across in a way you know within reason and just go for it and they're like this is gonna be our brand voice and we want to see how people are gonna react and it's fine no matter what happens like social media is a playground so 
it's the same with TikTok trends and everything. If mm. your brand has nothing, like if your brand could not uh, fit in a trend, like just don't try to fit it there, you know, leverage the things that would work for your target audience. Mm. So trying to do everything is never going to work, of course. So it's just the thing about really knowing where your brand stands and uh, where your audience is and understanding how to reach them without seeming and not genuine. Yeah. Yeah. That, no, that makes complete sense. And then to like use all of that, uh, the commonality that we just talked mm-hmm. about for a little bit, um, like going back to what I said before, what is one, you could say case study or, or company you really enjoy uh, consuming stuff from or watching? Um, I think probably you'll expect me to say this, but it's the only one that always comes to mind first. But Nike, I think, has a great social mm-hmm. media strategy. <laughs> and um, Absolutely. every time I say this, people are like, I knew you'd say that. But like, I think that just shows that it's true. it resonates with people. Um, like, I wish I could say a more niche brand, you know, but I think they are doing an amazing job, especially on Instagram, because they really focus on the, the power of storytelling and social media content. And they give the platform to the people and not the brand. Like they're not selling on Instagram. They're just creating a lifestyle brand and a story and a narrative. Um, And that is much better than having like cold salesy posts every day because it shows that it's a brand that cares about its customers and that will put effort into giving people a voice and actually, you know, all year round uh, promoting the causes that they stand for. So that's something that takes time and you can't just from one day to the other start optimizing that, you know, for any brand. But if you can establish that um, to the point where people can trust your brand in that way and understand that that content comes from a a place of authenticity, then I think that's a really good place to be. Yeah, that was, that was eye opening. Like, no, seriously, because I'm thinking about like sales and marketing and mm-hmm. long term cuz they're playing a long term game yeah. long term like everyone's going to start buying their stuff just out of yeah. subconscious mm-hmm. uh feeling that oh my god like, you know i'm i'm loyal to them they're doing it right i don't i don't when i buy something i don't second guess that they'll do they'll do a wrong act but then also yeah, exactly. what you said with like they're basically just getting out of the way for then people to uplift other people, which, it, which, yeah, is, exactly. which is so cool. Cause like, I think about Bleacher Report or like other companies and they just, yeah, they just do it so well without trying to like be it, you know, be the content mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, exactly. And then um, just on that topic, I wanted to bring up like another small example that just came to mind. Very different though um which is do you know lemonade probably you do since you're in the u.s the insurance Mm. company yeah um lemonade has a very interesting instagram presence um and i really love like it's very different from what we were talking about because yeah check it out um (laughs) but scroll further down like i'm talking about what they did a few months ago uh because they focus completely on just being very unique and very creative and they don't try to incorporate anything else into their strategy. So just because they have a very um, distinct brand color, like this bright pink, mm. their social media strategy used to be just dipping random objects like MacBooks into a fish tank full of, um, of like bright pink paint. Wow. So each one of their posts would be like a slow motion video of them dipping something really like random into that paint. <laughs> and um yeah, this is you know so like funny. it's yeah so if a brand can manage to make you say like oh wow like okay <laughs> that's weird i like that like never seen that before that's you know the other part of the spectrum where you would want to be <laughs> yeah yeah because that has nothing to do with insurance but uh yeah, or maybe because who would know? follow an account about insurance <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> <laughs> that's true yeah, I love that. Yeah, that that's like the ultimate uh, eye catcher right there. That's that's a great yeah, example. Yeah, right. It's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, people, if you're listening, look up Lemonade Inc. Lemonade underscore and then Inc. on Instagram. And scroll also. a bit further down to see their previous <laughs> posts. Even though what they're doing now is also really cool. But yeah. Yeah. Um, 
And then going back to you a little bit, what mm-hmm. is what is like some because you have you have some great stuff you're working on. What are some things you're aspiring to accomplish with the Z Link? And um, if you want to talk about that a little bit more, because I know mm-hmm. it was it was we didn't we touched on it, but if you want to dive deeper into that and some of your team and, and how that's going. Of course. So there are a couple of things that um, I'm very, very keen to do in the following months. Um, and I'm going to start working on that during Christmas now that my deadlines are <laughs> coming to an end. Um, so the first thing is that right now, the way I work is I collaborate with like external partners that are Gen Z marketers or Gen Z designers uh, on a project basis to assign them to projects as needed and whenever I see a um, like client and person fit uh, basically act accordingly and I do a lot of the work myself as well and I just like an important thing is that I would like to establish like a set team to have their full time in the following months that um, you know can be like Zlink only um, so that is of yeah. course something that I really want to let them working towards right now. And, um, the second thing is that I'm working to create some like educational materials online regarding Gen Z social media marketing, uh, probably an online course and a couple of eBooks to more easily just share what I know with people that don't want to outsource their marketing or anything like that, but would want some quick knowledge. So working on that. That's awesome. And then, thank you. And then the third thing is that I'm um, very consciously trying to use the, the Z-Link and its platforms to sort of elevate Gen Z entrepreneurship and encourage young entrepreneurs and share resources and stuff. And if you take a look at our Instagram, it's full of um, tools and resources that we would recommend to young marketers and young entrepreneurs and stuff to make their life easier. And um, I'd like to work towards establishing a community of um, Gen Z specifically people that are just very driven and either aspiring founders or already founders of a company or just people that want to dive deeper into the marketing industry. And have a community of people that can support each other and share resources and everything. That's really mm. important to me. So yeah. hopefully in the next few months. Yeah, absolutely. Because you can you can have a contract with one client for like a year, but you can mm-hmm. all, to expedite that and to actually help them and to help them save money too. You can just create that that course for them and like have them get that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I recently created a course, but it's in Greek because it was in collaboration with a Greek platform. So that's not very yeah. useful to most people. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that that's gonna be in English soon, hopefully. <laughs> nice. That's awesome. That's really cool. I, I love the uh, I love the goals. Um, I love that you want to eventually bring a community together. I think. Uh, a great example on my end of someone who's done that rapidly in the last mm-hmm. nine months has been Jack Butcher of uh, Visualize Value on oh, wow, yeah. Twitter. He, I mean, you've seen his it's work. It's insane. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. Like, I feel like he's a god of community building. I don't, I don't, <laughs> like, he's on another level. <laughs> yeah, because he, he, I mean, well, extreme, like, viral content um, boosted the following and, uh, both for himself and visualize value, but then from there sold mm-hmm. products, from there made courses, and then from there built a community. So yeah, it's um, amazing. I like I like the the framework. Um, mm-hmm. Like you're, you're you're kind of abiding by that without even knowing, which is which is shows the adeptness. <laughs> yeah, I actually like after I was thinking of creating educational materials and stuff. Um, when I started looking more into visualize value, because I'm um. I love, you know, Twitter stalking people that are doing cool things. Um, it motivated me even more to to create sort of materials that would help people because, you know, if I was second guessing it, then I was like, okay, you know, that would be useful for a community of people and I just need to reach that community. Mm. So, yeah, I really agree with you. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, for yourself, uh, I know mm-hmm. I, would, I would love to, because it is, you know, Dream Big Daily, I would love to ask you what some <clears throat> bigger dreams you have are uh, cuz I know the Z-Link is like you know you got the plan and goals set I'm excited to see the the stuff happen and unfold 
uh, for yourself, like who do you, who do you want to, who do you want to be? All right. Who do you want to become or, or who do you, what do you want to accomplish in like years to come or, <laughs> or whatever? God. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, no pressure, you know? <laughs> no, yeah. But, and, um... and then people, and then people can, <laughs> Cause I, and the reason I just realized I love asking that is I want to help. Um, I want to keep that top of mind to support people. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause I, it's great. cool. I, I, I mean, I love hearing people's mm-hmm. dreams, but like if there's something that comes across my path that I can be like, let me just throw this, you know, their way I'll do so. Yeah. That's great though. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very nice of you. Uh, okay. So there are a million things that I would like to do and it's um i don't know if it's just if it's a strength or a weakness that i'm always wanting to do like a million things at the same time i will see how that works out but (laughs) in the in the wider future um i definitely want to be doing something entrepreneurial um but i also would love to explore sort of full-time corporate marketing positions for a while to gain the skills that come with that Mm-hmm. Um, for example, okay, a few years ago, I had no idea if I would like to work at a big company. I really thought I would never want to be an entrepreneur. That was a whole other thing. Um, I did a program at Google at the headquarters in Dublin called Bold Immersion, where you shadow the marketing and sales teams and understand what they do. And you receive training, um, of like the, you know, the, the skills they use on a daily basis and everything. And um, I really liked the more corporate aspect of that, that basically combined marketing and sales together as they were doing it. Because at Google, it was basically pretty much the same team um, Mm. working on Google ads and everything like that. And that is definitely something that I would love to explore even for a couple of years. So, you know, I think... And I, I would also really want to, you know, besides the Z-Link, work on a more of, um, of a, a product-focused startup just because I think it's, um, I think it, it's something that would really excite me to work on. And, like, mm-hmm. that's what it's about, of course. So it's yeah. something that it would really excite me to market and to create and develop and just... Um, to, to help grow so there are so many different things that i am very motivated to explore mm. so i don't really want to restrict myself um in any way yet because i think if i can manage to do many things uh one after the other or you know somehow organize that into my future in a way that can help me gain the skills that come from each different thing um to then re- in, as a result properly understand what I truly enjoy doing more and what would um, bring me the most value and everything that would be the best way to go for me. So, Mm. yeah. And I'm also not, you know, I would love to explore like a a more management perspective as well, besides like purely marketing positions. So as you can tell, (laughs) there's a lot in my mind. That which is awesome. And And it's like, it's uh at the, at this age, especially, which I have a question about that is uh, absorbing as much as possible to then, you know, exactly. narrow, narrow down a little bit or whatever comes mm-hmm. from it. Um, yeah. I, I resonate with a couple of things there, but I, I was going to ask okay. you at like, at, at a, in the early twenties, right. There's probably other clients or companies or people that you look up to, um, that you help, but how, like, mm-hmm. how does one overcome that stigma of like, you're younger like we don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, yeah, true. So I'm 21. Uh, I just turned 21 last month, and I, I, I've been working in like that. My first professional experience in marketing was at 16 or 17, and of course, I faced like the um, sort of doubt that comes with being a young person in any industry. <laughs> um, but I've found that in social media marketing, I think uh, people subconsciously sort of grant you some sort of authority for being young and like sure. digital, which, you know, helps in my case. Um, so 
although I have heard quite a few very controversial opinions from older people I've had that thought they knew things about social media that are completely not true, that were just ruining their entire, you know, business mm-hmm. and marketing strategy. Um, I have rarely faced like actual stigma against being a young person. I th- and I think that's quite industry specific. So I'm lucky in that regard. Um, but then also entrepreneurship wise, um, which is a whole other thing. Of course, people don't really expect you to succeed or do anything of value when you're young and having a company. Um, and that isn't often directly expressed. But also I don't really care about that because I, I really enjoy what I'm doing and it's going well so far. So exactly. you know, if there is such stigma, uh, I'd love to discuss it directly with you know whoever has those thoughts. But um, <laughs> I think it's not really a problem right now because increasing like opportunities for our age, our generation are, are increasing. And if you know where to look and you keep yourself inspired and motivated, like you should be fine. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's definitely like a transfer of power, but I, I agree with a lot of what you said there. Absolutely. I feel like I just rambled about it. Sorry, but yeah, that that, no, I, I agree with that. It's like, you get this, you get this, like, uh, grant from others because it's like you you grew up in the age of digital so the ones mm-hmm. who don't know it's sort of like the uh, mom and pop shops or older people are like all right let me go to the person who knows it and those are the younger individuals yeah um, so yeah. that was sort of my selling point at the beginning you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah and I, I was gonna ask you as well with the google bold uh immersion mm-hmm. program what was something you enjoyed about seeing the operations with the sales and marketing teams Cause they're, they're like, Google is the top. Like that's, that's the top of the summit of the mountain yeah, of marketing. I know, right? mm, yeah, it was great. Um, I think what I really appreciated was um, how much of a, an inter- interdisciplinary approach they take in the work they do and how much they embrace cross collaboration between teams and how that is so well structured that it just works perfectly. Um, of course you have like specialists, but on a more technical level. Um, and I, I love that they encouraged us no matter our exact background to still look at all of the new skills we were being trained for with an open mind. And for example, you know, learn to pitch a service without ever having done sales before or marketing. Um, Mm. and also, I don't know, like, I felt like that the... (laughs) Of course, like that's very cliche again, but the culture really embraces um, what they stand for in terms of that. So I think Absolutely. if you can if you can have a company that fosters that culture where everyone is um, everyone understands what everyone else is doing, and uh, there's a lot of collaboration going on to the point where you can learn from others and understand who complements your skills and what else you could do well besides your your specific job, then uh, that makes for a system that just ends up working really well. So I really admire that, you know, I would love to, to explore it from the inside. Mm. Yeah. That, that different perspective uh, definitely pays off and it shows with all they do. Yeah. And, and uh, the, the last question I was going to ask you since uh, the holidays are basically around this time, what is a, Mm -hmm. what is a book that, are you into reading? Of course, I read okay. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what What yeah. are What are some books you would uh, gift to someone uh, during the oh, holidays for for a gift? I love that question. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. okay, so books I gift often: Mindset by Carol Dweck. Have you yeah, read it? I th- I, I'm, it's yes, it's on my list. I, I really. You should get it. just get it over with. Like it's <laughs> important. You'll be like yes. Um, yeah. So Mindset by Carol Dweck. Um, Mm. I feel like I'm just going to name like all the um, business books that you would see, but like the good ones, Originals by Mm. Adam Grant, I loved as well. Mm. That's something I gift to my entrepreneurial friends. Um, I would definitely recommend. Um, Recently, I I read a book, forgot the name of the author, but it was called Solve for for Happy. like dot dot the equation of happiness or something like that and i thought like i 
I like self-help books and stuff once in a while. And that one was very interesting because it, um, it gave some really nice insight regarding happiness and control and time and like issues that really torment us all from time to time. Mm. Um, so that I would really gift to pretty much anyone. Um, there's more, but I'm forgetting right now. But no, yeah. That, that... <laughs> yeah, yeah it's it th- those are solid um yeah my one of my one of my more favorite entrepreneurs uh tom bilyeu of impact theory he talks about mm-hmm. mindset um when i when i when there's a movie or a book that comes up multiple times uh i know i have to get it so i'll be getting it <laughs> has that one come up multiple times it it has it definitely has nice yeah yeah <laughs> so you I, pr- I appreciate you, i appreciate you pushing the needle forward to push me over the edge to, to of get. course yeah yeah For i mean sure. it's things that i think you already know but it's it's good to see how important it is to have a growth mindset in comparison mm-hmm. to a fixed mindset that doesn't let you grow and develop yeah absolutely i i'm just fascinated by the brain and and, and stuff pertaining to yeah. like human human development and because that i mean everything you think of sales marketing uh engineering like if you if mm-hmm. you don't know the basis of yourself then what's the point um exactly, it derives from that yeah. yeah would love to hear your book recommendations as well like you should make a list of the ones you've heard during your podcast and everything that's that's i that's a great idea when uh the our website's going to be further developed and i i want to add mm-hmm. so many things so that would be a really Amazing. that'd be a good one yeah great great <laughs> i feel like it would be very useful yeah absolutely I, I really appreciate there is so much here um, and I hope people that listen, I, I know, I know they would get value out of this, but I'm excited to see everything. The further growth will, will stay in contact for sure. But you're, thank you. You're yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thank you for the talk as well. <laughs> awesome. Enjoy the rest of your time in Greece. Perfect. Bye. Thank you. You too. Have a good night.